Good afternoon, all. So it's a pleasure to have you all here with us for this Indie Virtual Conference, a congregation of uh, learning and development leaders and thought leaders from across the globe and India. We'll be uh, discussing about various trends and uh, you know various aspects of learning throughout these next two days as well so uh, i'm happy to welcome you to the first session of the lnd virtual conference here and uh, today i have with us donald edge taylor who is a chairman of the learning and performance council here so so before i move on i would like to kind of uh, set the context here today first and then uh, uh, give a brief introduction about the topic that we are covering this particular session and then later move on to introducing the speaker as well uh, then i'll hand it over to donald to take you through the session so you can uh, use the chat window on the side of the screen that uh, you can see to post your questions and we'll be happy to take it up uh, at the end of the session so uh, before uh, i start as i mentioned so what are we covering here today so donald donald taylor has examined scores of case studies of workplace learning technology implementation over a period of some 20 years to discover what makes them successful or not, whether it's a complex global LMS implementation or using Twitter locally. So Donald has found all implementations share some very common features. So join him on this uh, webcast to discover what these are and learn how to make sure your next implementation is supported, successful, and valuable to your organization. So there are a few points that we'd like to cover here. Plus in ensuring their buying, using an agile approach to implementation, and lastly, ensuring your continued success post-launch. Let me also take this opportunity to welcome you to the speaker, uh, Donald Desh Taylor, who has actually uh, agreed uh, to do the session to us, and it's a great honor to have you with us, Donald. So Donald Taylor is a veteran of learning skills and human capital industries with experience at every level from delivery to the chairman of the board. As a recognized commentator and organizer in the field of workplace learning and learning technologies, Donald is passionately committed to helping developing the learning and development profession. Chairman of the Learning Performance Institute since 2010, his background ranges from training delivery to managing director and vice president positions in software companies. Donald took his own internet-based training business from concept to trade uh, sale in 2001 and has been a company director during several other acquisitions. Now based in London, he has lived and traveled extensively outside the UK and now travels regularly internationally to consult and speak about workplace learning. So we have a really uh, you know, informed thought leader in workplace learning here with us today to take us through what it takes to actually implement a, successfully implement a learning management system. Uh, welcome to the show, Donald. Thank you very much, Nishant. Great to be here. And uh, it's an honor to be uh, sharing my experience of something like 20 years looking back over learning technology implementations with you, trying to make sure that you don't make the same mistakes that other people have made and hopefully are able to benefit from this i can't guarantee everything will be a success but i hope that uh, what will happen is you'll be you'll decrease your risk and you'll increase your chances of a successful implementation <clears throat> it, we have half an hour together half an hour well half an hour plus some time for questions and answers half an hour is not a great deal of time to cover all of the 20 years plus that I've looked back over learning technology implementations uh, for writing my my book. Um, the, sorry, the book is called Learning Technologies in the Workplace and it's, uh, it was out uh, last month. And so in half an hour, I'm going to try to compress down as much as possible what we've talked about and in the book and just deal with the most important issues to help you increase the chances of success with your next implementation. My a uh, key aim is going to be to to guide you towards those those key points but please do ask questions during the course of the presentation and at the end that will enable us to check that i'm giving you what's useful and also deal with any specific points that you've got first thing i'd like to do is to begin with a question um if we had a bit more time we'd actually have a proper conversation about this together but because time is condensed i'm going to ask this question and then answer it myself so the question is what causes learning technology implementations to fail and when i ask this question to people uh, throughout the globe whether it's in australia or asia or america or europe the answers are varied but they usually come down to two things some people in the audience will say 
Well, it was because the technology didn't work. Uh, other people will say, well, it's because I people didn't want to do it. But typically, people who are smart and have been there and looked at implementations and have experienced success and failure will say, it's because we didn't have the buy-in. And I say the buy-in, that sounds, that sounds like a small part of it. It sounds like you should do the implementation and then get the buy-in afterwards. But actually, it's absolutely essential for an implementation. Let me take you through what I mean by this and try to build up the three key things for an implementation. And then finally, I'm going to end with a, a rallying cry just to keep everybody on track with why we bother with doing this at all. So let me start with what I think the problem with a lot of learning technology implementations is, and it's, it's this. Here's a guy assembling a bit of flat pack furniture, which people do all the time. Certainly in, in my house, a lot of the furniture I've got is bought from Ikea. You get the instructions and you go through it. Now, the nice thing about this is it's quite, it's quite restful in a way. You have a set of instructions. You begin with instruction number one. You go through to instruction number, I don't know, 17, and you've got something made and you've done the job. A lot of people imagine that implementing a learning technology is like what this gentleman is doing here. You start with instruction one, you go through to 17, and the job is done. But it's actually much more complicated than that. Yes, you have to have the instructions. You need to have a methodology. You need to know what you're doing technically. But that is about one third of the job, and it's not the most important third. Because after all, suppose you're assembling uh, a desk like this guy is, and you want a desk in the corner of your office. Great. But say you don't work alone in the office, say you're working with other people. So you have to have a desk that's the right shape of desk, right size of desk, it has to sit in the right place in the office, it has to presumably be the right color and style. If you have one style of desk and other people's are different, they might not like that. If you have one that's too large, other people might not like it at all because you're taking up their space. If you have a desk that uh, is, is fine as a desk, but what people really needed was a cabinet or a place to put things, then you've done a great job with a technology implementation, but it's actually completely useless because what you needed was something else. So you get the point. Building something is only part of the solution. The real solution comes from understanding the needs of the environment you're in and the wishes of the other people you're working with. And of course, with learning, you're working with other people all the time. It's a crucial part of it. So for me, when I say what is success in a learning technology implementation, indeed, in anything just about, but in the learning technology implementation, the answer for me is very clear. Success is meeting expectations. You have a conversation with people, you know what is supposed to happen, and then you put in place something that is right. That's very different from simply starting instruction one, going through to instruction 17, and building something. The emphasis here is on working with people. So, my checklist for assembling flat pack furniture is you've got to have a method, you need your instructions, otherwise you end up with bits and pieces left over that are no good. You have to have skills, you have to have the tools, the hammer, the Allen keys, and you have to have a mindset. If you're assembling flat pack furniture, you need to be able to have conversations with people about what you're doing. Do I need a desk, a cabinet, should it be oak, should it be birch, and so on. Actually, the checklist for a learning technology implementation is not very different. It's just the things are in a different order. The most important thing in a learning technology implementation is the mindset. What is it that you set out with down the path of creating the learning technology implementation? Then you need the skills and the tools, and we'll talk about those in a minute. And finally, yes, you do need a method. Undoubtedly, you need a method. If you have the first two and you don't have a method, then you may succeed, you may not, but it's very likely you'll miss out something quite important. So, with all that being said, you might say, Don, this is great, but I'd like to know, I'd like to have a checklist of things that I can do when I'm doing my learning technology implementation. Telling me I need a mindset and skills and tools is all very well. Fine. 
here is my checklist. I'm actually developing a checklist at the moment that I'm circulating to people. And I'll give you at the end a URL which you can down, from which you can download this checklist. It runs to seven pages at the moment. And the idea is that it's going to be a growing document that will change as I talk to more people about it. And it will help you do a better job. It is not a guarantee of success. So the checklist always has to be used by people intelligently. But hopefully it will be a guide to a few of the things you might miss out if you hadn't thought about it with an implementation. So there are three things, the mindset, the skills, the method. On the mindset side, you can see there are four things there. Of all the things in the learning technology implementation, the mindset is the most important. And for me, of those four things, the I don't, I won't, I'm not going to drill into them now. We can talk about them later on if you're very concerned about it or want to know more. Um, the ambiguities and weakness bit is the most important. By the way, I should point out that um, if you download the, the checklist, it, it has a paragraph describing each of these things in more detail and some questions around it. So you, 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 you have a chance to learn more about it that way. The checklist, of course, is completely free. You don't even have to register for, anything, register for it. I want it to be used widely, and I want your feedback to help me develop a better document. So that's my checklist, right, those three things. And today, in the 17 minutes we've got left, I'm going to concentrate on these four parts of it. Abilities and weakness, performance consulting and feedback, and finally, the method as a whole, because that is important. If you don't have that, you're, not, you're going to fail. Here then are the four things we're going to cover, mindset, skills, method, and finally, a rallying cry, my chance to remind us all why we are doing this job. All right, let's look at abilities and weakness. We talk a lot in learning and development often about unconscious incompetence. So the idea that you can not know you're not good at something, uh, and that's down the bottom right-hand corner of the, of the screen here. And a lot of the work we do in learning and development tends to try to be to get people up to being consciously competent, like a musician or an athlete who, who does something really well. But actually, with learning technology implementation, what I'm concerned about is getting people from being unconsciously incompetent to consciously incompetent. What I mean by this is we can't do everything. We can't know everything. And all the failures I've seen have largely come from people being down in the unconscious incompetence quadrant not knowing that they didn't know things. To help you overcome that, I want to introduce you to something which I call the perspective grid. It gives you a bigger picture of what you're looking at. This, by the way, is a picture of Sicily at the bottom of Italy. It's a gorgeous place, and I love the sense of perspective when I'm on holiday there. I unplug, and I can see things with a much bigger perspective. So, with... An implementation, we should be thinking about what's the role of L&D, what's the role of the organization, where are we internally, where are we externally? Let me explain. For me, within the organization, L&D in its own department has to be expert. We have to absolutely be in charge of what we're doing and know how learning and development works. Fine. But that's not enough. And very often in implementations that fail, people imagine that being good at L&D is enough, and it isn't. We have to fill out the other three quadrants. This is a general background thing that I think everybody in L&D needs to be on top of. So outside of learning and development itself, it's crucial to be engaged with the rest of the community. I'll explain in a minute what I mean by this in a bit more detail. Outside our organization and our own profession we need to be aware of what's going on in britain right now you can't work effectively unless you're aware of what's happening politically and economically with brexit uh, you're just going to you're going to miss something i have conversations all the time with people where the bigger picture is affecting their daily lives and if you don't know about it you're going to lose out but the most important is that we have to not just be expert in our own field and sorry expert in our own area in the organization we have to also be connected internally with the rest of the organization. Some detail on that. Within learning and development, down here in the expert bottom left-hand corner, 
yes, we need to have great efficiency measures that we're doing a good job. We need to know about our team and be on top of our procedures. Externally, you guys who are here right now need to come to events like this, absolutely. Get engaged with the external community, learn. We need to be on top of the external trends and we need to know the rest of the organization, what matters to it. What's the health of the organization, the procedures, the debates and so on. Just think about the guy making his desk. If he's making his desk in the office, you can't put the desk up and just, just hope it's gonna work. You have to have those conversations with the rest of the organization to make sure that what you're doing fits in and works with what everybody else is, has on their mind. In terms of an implementation, being connected is the most important part. The second most important thing for learning and development is to make sure the systems of management that you've got internally can extend to a learning technology implementation. Very often, people are quite good at managing a department, but they're bad at managing an implementation because it doesn't it has no relevance. The systems of management systems you've got in place for doing a good job with your uh, your content development team have nothing to do with project managing a technological implementation. So the unconscious incompetence is imagining that you that that's fine. Being consciously incompetent is saying, well, I know that we don't have the skills. We don't have the skills to manage this. Fine. We're going to go and get the project management skills from elsewhere. Either we recruit somebody into the team or we borrow somebody, usually from IT, to help us roll out this technology. That's why I say that moving from that area of unconscious incompetence to knowing that you haven't got the skills is crucial for avoiding risk. Practical things, practical skills that actually you need to be doing in each of those four quadrants to help your implementation succeed. As I say, project management is probably the most important internally, making sure you've got the right people in your team. Those two things really resonate as being common factors with successful implementations. But with the whole organization being connected with it, you can see that you can only do things like having clear communications, good data transfer, perhaps dealing with legacy systems, ensuring a single sign-on, all those things can only be done if you're in good communication with the rest of the organization. Now, I've gone on about this quite a lot because this is the most important part of this presentation. I'm going to pause some drink of water. If we were live and doing this face-to-face, -face, we'd have now what I call a consider and consolidate period where we'd talk to each other about this. Right now, I want you to consider this and take this away. And there are two more questions like this, the consider and consolidate questions. Take this away and consider how well connected are you with the rest of your organization? What do you need to do to change? And how will you do that? Being connected with the organization is the crucial, crucial factor to success. We're going through this at lightning speed. I'm going to move on now to the next point. Mindset, that ability of those four things in mindset, the most important one being to know what you don't know is, as I say, essential. And we've had a look at a perspective grid to help you understand some of the things that you might not know. I'm going to move on now to skills and very quickly going to look at this. And in particular, we're going to look at nemawashi, which is a Japanese term for moving around the roots. Here's Andy Wooler. Andy Wooler's implemented a lot of learning management systems. The reason why I'm going to concentrate on this thing called nemawashi and why I say this, the skills part of an implementation is all about people is because, as Andy says, you can do anything with technology, but people can also stop you doing just about everything. That's a, a common phrase, or rather, this sentiment was expressed by just about everybody I talked to when I was interviewing people for my book, that ultimately success rests on working well with people. The Japanese term for what I'm going to express now is nemawashi. Nemawashi literally means when you're moving a tree from one place to another, digging down around the roots, preparing it properly so that when you pick it up and move it, it doesn't die. That blog at the bottom there, I recommend as an, to read about an American who worked for 17 years in Japan and in the US, talking about two very different ways of managing change and how the Japanese way, to his mind, is more effective. This presentation will be distributed by 
um, to all of you guys who are attending. So you don't have to try to write that blog down. Don't worry. To do Nimbawashi, to make sure that you've got everything sorted out before you do your implementation, you need a lot of people's skills. Here are some of them. I want to look very quickly at two of them, performance consulting and feedback gathering. Performance consulting, I highly recommend if you haven't dealt with this, that you go and work with Nigel Harrison, or sorry, not work with, you can do, but go and look at the work of Nigel Harrison, the performance consulting UK, that's the URL at the bottom. I have no financial interest in Nigel's work. All I know is that I've seen it transform the way people do learning technologies and learning development generally. And he talks about moving from solutioneering, where people come in with an answer, to really understanding what issues are and dealing with those. He has three stages to go through for a successful performance consulting engagement, where you understand the needs of an organization. The first is to build trust, the second to understand the problems, and finally build powerful solutions that tackle those. The most important of these is building trust and rapport. Again and again, talking to people who've done great implementations, I found that the great, the people doing great uh, implementations have either deliberately built up rapport with people or they've worked in the organization for a long time and already have that rapport and trust with people and they don't really think about it. But of course, although that is the most important bit, where we tend to start is building powerful solutions. We come in with the answer. Hey, here's my LMS, here's my social learning, here's my mobile solution. It doesn't matter. If you haven't got the trust at the beginning, it's not going to be used. Now, how do you build trust and rapport? There is a tremendous amount. I recommend just going and buying some of Nigel's books, reading his blog, learning about it. Here are eight skills that are crucial as part of the biggest skill of active listening, which is the most important part of building trust, is to listen to what people are saying and understand what they really mean. Attend, be there, properly listening. Give short encourages, little noises during the course of a conversation that move people along. Repeating back what people have said in a variety of ways. Open questioning, not closed questioning, to really explore what people want. And the most important question, of course, is why? Reflecting feeling about things, using people's words. So I, if I understand it correctly, you're saying that this is important to you because dot, dot, dot. Summarizing, which is another example of that, that was feeling and summarizing. Testing understanding. Check what you say, what somebody has said, rather than going down the road of imagining that you've you understood it when you haven't. And discriminating between emotional and rational responses. Getting all that right in your listening and interactions with people is the first and most important step to performance consulting. What about gathering feedback? So at the beginning of, a comp the beginning of an implementation, you absolutely have to be engaged with your stakeholders with this. In development and during, feed and during testing and implementation, it's crucial to gather feedback. Nick Shackleton-Jones put together a, an onboarding program for BP when he was there that transformed the way people came onto the organization and has now been used by something like um, a half of BP's 120,000 full-time and part-time employees. And he did this, he built this great solution by working with people all the way through, including in the development stage, understanding very closely from employees what they needed when they were onboarding, at the same time as working with stakeholders over a eight month period of developing this product, he had 24 meetings with not just users, but also people from legal, from branding, from marketing, from HR, all the people who gave him difficult things to think about. And because he sought out the difficult questions to begin with, Nick was able not to have to deal with those after launch. It's much better to get everybody on board by listening to them properly in a managed workshop environment than to launch something and find that you've made a mistake and your reputation is shot. People don't come back. Jeremy Smith at Herman Miller, during the testing of his uh, performance support system and after implementation, was able to use an online focus group method where he pulled together groups of typically 12 to 15 people for a set period of time, one hour, 
with two people facilitating, one to facilitate, one to take notes. And during the course of this, they did some very specific things. They only asked five questions, not all the questions the technical guys wanted to ask, but just five general questions that allowed open discussion. Before they did that, they made sure that everyone was introducing themselves online and felt comfortable that, to trust other people to share their feelings. Without that first five minutes of introductions, the rest of the conversation wouldn't have worked. Finally, they compiled the notes and fed them back into the development process. They regularly found small things which made a huge difference to people's perception. The same as Nick. Nick was finding out the potential problems up front. Jeremy was finding out the problems during testing and implementation. But in both cases, they were able to find where things might go wrong in conversation with people and to end up altering the product so that it not only overcame those objections, but was seen as being useful. That's very different from building a desk in an office. You don't change a desk as you go. And that's why the desk metaphor that we have in our minds for building something is a poor one. The agile development, working with people, getting feedback during the course of implementation is something which there isn't really a physical metaphor for, and yet is what makes a successful implementation. So the two questions I'd like you to consider and consolidate when you're thinking about this now and perhaps afterwards over a cup of tea is how will you generate trust in both you and in your implementation? And what feedback methods will you use to find out what's potentially going wrong before it goes wrong? We're very close to wrap up stage now. I'm gonna push through. We've gone through the mindset, we've gone through skills. What about method? We do need a method. There are lots of models of change. Talking to people, I've come up with one model. It's not a model which is patented in any way. Anybody can use it. And it's simply a reflection of what I've seen as being good practice. And people have said to me, reading the book, yes, Tom, that makes sense, actually. The, the, these six steps are pretty much what I went through when I was doing my implementation. First, you understand the issues. Then you plan what you're going to do. You test a beta product in some way. Then you implement it. Then you assess whether you met your initial aims. Either you then go on to sustain it, or more likely in agile development, you go through this loop of three things several times. Test, implement, assess. Test, implement, assess until you go into the maintain slash sustain phase. And that is it. During the, the, the checklist has two or three pages on this. So feel free, feel free to implement it to get more. You probably feel, yeah, I know all about this. And if you've done any learning technology, you will do. But I'd like you to consider this. Which stage do you feel least sure of? One of those stages will have a niggling doubt in it for you. And I'd like you to consider, all right, what is it that I could do better next time? I'd like to just end with a rallying cry, because very often we get bogged down in the detail of what we're doing in our profession. When I ask people, what do they do in L&D? They tend to answer, well, I design courses. I deliver material. I do performance support. When Sir Christopher Wren, this is St Paul's Cathedral in London where I live, when Sir Christopher Wren was designing and building St Paul's Cathedral, he went through it uh, and he passed three masons who were working on stone. And he asked the first one, what are you doing? And he said, I'm building a, uh, I'm, I'm designing a gargoyle for the outside of the building. Fine. He asked the second one, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm earning some money for my family. You know, the fact that he was building this wonderful cathedral was just, incidental to him it was just a job and he asked the third man what are you doing and he said i'm building a cathedral he knew that he was part of something much bigger but that little bit of work that he was doing that stone he was carving was part of building something magnificent and that's what we do in learning and development we shouldn't forget it the role of lnd is not what we do it's not carving the stone delivering the course it's not designing some performance support stuff. Yes, that's crucial, but it's what we make possible by doing that. What we do is we enable individuals and organizations to fulfill their potential. When we're doing our learning technology implementations, let's not lose sight of this bigger aim. And indeed, let's not lose sight of it in whatever we do. 
by the way, this presentation, which you'll get, does have a whole lot more stuff on the, on the implementation method at the, on the back of it. But that's my final slide. To download the checklist, please go to that URL. Uh, I'm running a beta course on this, which is free. Um, and for more on that, please just send an email to that email address, LTW, Learning Technologies in the Workplace, at donaldhtaylor.com. And if you've got any other comments, like you want to have these slides or anything else, please send me an email. And please, of course, on Twitter and LinkedIn, get in touch. I am on those and everything else. Donald H. Taylor. That's me done. Do we have any questions? <coughs> Thank you so much, Donald. That is a very interesting session, especially the last part is something that I really liked. It's about making things possible for others and not just in terms of what you're doing. Yeah. So a couple of very interesting points as well I picked up, especially the one you talked about, um, you know, moving from solutioneering to having a real understanding and all that. So it is very interesting. So I do have a few questions here. Go ahead. So, uh, so the first question obviously is on uh, one major, uh, you know, issue that most of us face afterward after the implementation. So it comes adoption. So Rahul Singh is asking low adoption rate of any learning technology solution is one of the biggest problems. So yeah. how do we solve it? Uh, absolutely right. Adoption is the key issue, and in just about every learning technologies conference in London since two thousand. We've always talked about adoption. Nick Shackleton Jones from BP, uh, now at PA Consulting, who I talked about there, has a very interesting comment on this. He says, if you wait until you have to ask the question about adoption, you've left it too late. In other words, the answer is to start with understanding what the problem is. And if we are trying to solve a particular problem, then the people will come to the solution you put in place that's not quite simple enough to do it to, to by itself we have to have a real problem that's solving and we have to make sure that along the course of developing and implementing the solution we are in constant contact with the people who will be using it and very importantly their managers if I look at great solutions, like, for example, the HC1 solution in the UK, it was part of a very complex communication plan. Now, I haven't even talked about communication in this presentation, but of, uh, I'd say of the, of the three people skills that you need, um, you've got performance consulting, you've got feedback, and then I think you've got communication skills. It's also the skill which learning and development is probably weakest at. So I would, th there are a number of free resources on communications out there. I'm gonna make a note right now that my next blog on LinkedIn will be about communications during a, a, um, an implementation. So the short answer is start with the real aim, communicate all the way through the presentation, through, through the implementation. By the time you've rolled out, people will be ready to come to it and want to use it. That's the short answer. The long answer is read my next blog on LinkedIn where I'll go into this in much more detail. Okay, thank you so much. So I hope that answered our question. So uh, one other question that um, I had was about, um, you know, there are, uh, when you look at the learning technology implementation, there are basically two mindsets. One mindset is obviously about the employer who's actually, you know, sponsoring the implementation of learning technology. The other part is obviously about the mindset of the employer, employee who's actually using it. So how do we manage both to make sure uh, that you already mentioned about communication? But what are the other factors that you can actually help uh, manage those mindsets and have a very successful implementation? Uh, there, there's a third party as well here, which I mentioned during the communication piece, which is crucial, which is the managers. There are yes. always people caught in the middle here. Um, yep. The managers decide how people are going to use their time. And if, you've, if you don't get the managers on board, then, then you can't win. So the, it, it does come back to the communication piece as well, but I just want to come back to communication and think about it in more detail. When we say communication <clears throat> in learning and development implementations, we often tend to use it in a very different way to how we might use it the rest of our lives. If I, <clears throat> if I don't, my, my kids are growing up now pretty much, but if I didn't pick my child up from school when they were younger, um, my wife would be, but my wife had to say, well, what, why, why didn't you communicate with me? You, you, you were due to pick them up, you didn't pick them up, what happened? If I said, well, I sent you an email, 
uh, telling you I wasn't going to make it, that wouldn't be a satisfactory answer. Because although that is communication, it's not really communication. It's just sending somebody an email. During a learning technology implementation, just sending emails to people is not communication either. Communication involves both giving information and seeking out people's opinion and responding to it. It's a conversation. And getting the mindset of the learner involved means having conversations with them. What are they really doing? What are the real problems they face? How can we really support them? It also means having those conversations with the managers. Not about the employee, but about the manager. What are your problems? How, how is this implementation going to support you? And how can I help you do a better job? If you don't have those conversations, nobody's going to use it because nobody's going to be given the time by the manager to use it. So it's a, a crucial part. And I, I referred to this during Nick Shapton Jones's case study. A crucial part is seeking out the difficult conversations with people who, you know what, they might not be your friend a lot of the time, but precisely because they're not your friend, you need to speak to them because they're the people who are going to be deciding whether this thing succeeds or fails. And if you can get them on board, then not only will their people use it, but likely there will be an advocate for you with other managers. So the answer is to concentrate partly on the individuals, but more on their immediate managers to make sure that they feel they're getting value. And in the book, I go into a number of number of examples of this and, and some tools and tricks for doing it. Oh, great. Thank you for answering that. So another question is coming, obviously, uh, we are becoming more data driven. So that's a question that related to data and metrics. So what are some of the metrics we should look for, uh, you know, to determine the effectiveness or success of the learning technology implementation? There's only one metric you need to be concerned about. What does the business think is important? It might be sales, it might be turnover, it might be, in one case, <clears throat> it was the return rate of bad goods. And what was happening is this was a man who was working for a company in the US. Uh, he worked out that people were returning electric drills and other power tools are under warranty and we're getting their money back on these tools but they shouldn't have been they were void they, the, the, the goods weren't covered by the warranty so he worked out this was a problem and he dealt with it he reduced the number of returns from four percent of sales to 1.8 percent of sales and it doesn't sound like much that saved the company 33 million dollars now nobody said to him that you've got to go and do this. He worked it out by himself. It was something that obviously had a huge return on investment. What was interesting about that implementation for Tektronix, and the guy's name is Matt DeFeo, what's interesting about that implementation was that it wasn't very sophisticated. It wasn't mobile learning. It was simply a few check sheets and the deep involvement of the managers in helping their people do their job better distributed via an electronic medium. So the key thing there is not the sophistication of the, of the resource. It is simply that you've got a solution which tackles a real business problem. So the question was, what metrics do we need to be concerned about? The answer is, go to the business and ask them what their problem is. And that's the metric you need to be chasing. Great. Thank you. I'm also cognizant of the time. So we are at 3.40. So we have another five minutes left. So probably okay. we'll get the last two questions here. Okay. So uh, another question is that, uh, you know, what are some of the generic or robust features that you generally see in a, in a very successful or a great LMS? In a great LMS? Well, um, <coughs> I'd say two things. Um, firstly, uh, it, <laughs> It has to be able to deal with data well. It's a really boring answer, but in the past, uh, I think less so now, but in the past, LMSs have not always dealt with data well. And so you couldn't, for example, I don't know, search for your courses via the location in which they might be delivered. 
you had to search for them via the catalog's existing um, taxonomy, which is ridiculous. So it has to simply be able to deal with well, but the second with data well. But the second thing that is important is the user interface. It's absolutely crucial, especially today, when people have such a high consumer expectation of what their technology should be like. It's got to look good. And there are a number of people who've really led on changing their interface recently. Um, I'm not going to mention names because I have to be neutral, but I, I would say that have a one of the stumbling blocks to implementation with an LMS is absolutely what does it look and not just what does it look like, what's the experience like for me as a user? Do, am I able to do all the things I'd expect to be able to do with it without having to be trained or told by somebody? And if that's true, then I'm not saying that's guaranteeing a successful implementation. It's a hygiene factor. It's something you need to have. But once you've got it, then at least you can then do everything else to make sure that it's successful. If you don't have it, it's very difficult to make it succeed. So there's those two things that I think are crucial in this hand. Um, a, great, um, a great back end where you can really deal with data properly. And I, 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 as part of that, I'd say, and are able to interface well with other services, particularly web services. And at the front end, it's got to have a great user experience. OK, what's the other question? Okay, so um, another one, I have another uh, question here that's almost related to data. So uh, the question is about what is the kind of analytics or features that uh, these LMSs offer rather than just reporting? Well, I, I wouldn't say rather than just reporting, I'd say that all, all the analytics have to be shown through reporting and shown by reporting in a sophisticated way. Um, uh, for me, the, the key thing for an LMS to be able to do is to be able to, I, I mentioned, I'll just say two things. Firstly, is to tie in with other systems. So you want to be able to, um, where possible, see how the activity on the LMS works with, I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying to avoid the word causes, but works with and correlates with other things in the workplace. So ideally, you want to see, does activity in the learning system correlate with improved performance elsewhere? So that's a crucial piece of analytics you need to have but you do still need to be able to report on it so i think the crucial piece of analytics is correlation with other systems and the analytics piece needs i would say absolutely to be hierarchically controllable so you should be able to run where possible reports from the center that look across the entire database but equally the manager of their own team whether they are whether it's a you know a 500 people department or a six people team should also be able to see the great data that is possible just for that group so the answer to the question again firstly make sure you've got great data not just from the system itself but from other systems in the organization and secondly make sure that everyone in the organization can see what's relevant to them thanks to hierarchical permissions at the entire level, at the divisional level, and at the team level. And Nishant, that's it. OK, great. So I think uh, we are running out of time here. So uh, thank you so much for taking the questions. Thank you so much for your presentation and the whole insightful session. So I will look forward to having you with us again for the future webinars and future webcasts and probably one of our conferences as well. So once again, on behalf of People Matters, thank you for uh, taking us through the session, Donald. And also thank you to all the participants who have been here, who have been listening, who have been sharing the questions. Uh, it's great to have you with us again and hope to see you again tomorrow and the day after for the upcoming sessions. So tomorrow at 11 o'clock, we have another session on personalization, the new front of L new frontier for LED by Stefan Van Hulding. Uh, so that's at 11 a.m. tomorrow at the same uh, URL. So you can just log in at 11 a.m. Make sure you block the calendars so that you don't miss that session. So once again, thank you, Donald. Thank you all, and have a wonderful day.